Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, just a few announcements uh, for today. Uh, there is the opportunity to do uh, services indoors, but we have chosen not to uh, for this coming Sunday, um, just because of the numbers that are happening in St. Louis County. So we will still have outdoor uh, parking lot service this coming Sunday. And then uh, just a remind uh, confirmants, we had our orientation, but if you missed that, please get in touch with me. Confirmation is beginning on October 11th. Uh, it will go from 6.30 until 7.15. Uh, kids are invited to come and with masks and we will observe uh, social distancing. Uh, with that, I think we're gonna begin our worship service. Let's begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us in all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have turned from your loving embrace to go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors, and we keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Savior and Lord. Amen. 
Good morning. The first lesson for today is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleaned it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewn out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant plenty. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Here ends the reading of the first lesson. The psalm for today is Psalm 80, verses uh, 7 through 15. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have bought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mounds were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretch out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? A wild boar of the forest has ravished it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. Here ends the reading of the psalm. The second lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, beginning with uh, verse 4. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, so as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gain I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on, toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading of the second lesson. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Praise to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a, a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. 
But the tenant seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was God's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they realized that Jesus was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, kids. Uh, good to be with you also uh, this beautiful day. And uh, as you can tell, I have something that I brought with me. And I'm pretty sure that you probably have one of these at home also. This is uh, my grandson's bike, and he likes to ride it. But I just want to kind of use it as kind of uh, just a sample uh, because I want to talk about when I was young and was given a bike. My, uh, my father wanted, I was bothering him for I don't know how long, I want a bike, I want a bike, I want to be able to ride with my friends and, and whatever. And this was not a small item, so my father kind of made a deal with me. He said, uh, Jeff, if, you, if I get this bike for you, then you have to make a promise uh, to me that you will help your mother when it is time to get groceries. Now, you have to know that when I was a young boy, um, you know, we used to go to markets and uh, we'd pick stuff up, produce, whether it was uh, bread or, or things at the grocery store. And then we'd go to another place to pick up meat and another place to pick up fruits and vegetables. So there was a lot of running around. So my mother would uh, often give me a list of things that she wanted me to pick up and I would go and pick them up for her. And that worked out really well for a while, but then, you know, uh, as most young kids uh, get, I was a little bit selfish with my time. And pretty soon I had no time for my mother. I had no time for getting her groceries. And one day I came to get my bike and I go with my friends and I, it was gone. And I couldn't figure that out. So I went to my dad and I says, Dad, uh, what happened to the bike? And he says, well, we had an agreement that you would make sure that you helped your mother. And now it seems like you have no time for her. And so I am uh, holding your bike. And in the meantime, I'm going to let your sister use your bike. You can imagine how I felt about that. I was not happy about that at all. But it was a lesson for me. And I, I think it's a part of the text that we hear today. And that is that God has given us many good gifts, but he expects us to use them and to produce good things with those gifts. Um, I don't think God takes our gifts away. Uh, maybe that's not a good image. But sometimes just by our moving away, we are taking our own gifts away. Um, when we don't spend time in prayer anymore with God, God seems to be going away. When we don't come to church anymore, sometimes there's that sense that God is not present. Um, these are just lessons that I think are meant to make us think a little bit. And I just want you to think about that. It's not a, it's not a, a matter of you're being bad or good or anything like that, but just thinking about the gifts that God has given to you and remember that you're meant to use those gifts. Um, so thank you. I hope uh, the next time you get on your bike, you are reminded of that and uh, think about all the wonderful gifts that God has given to you. Have a good day. Good morning, grace and peace be with you this morning from God our Creator, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from the Spirit of the risen Christ alive in us. Amen. So Jesus tells 
another parable in the gospel lesson for today. He hasn't moved. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's still in the temple. Crowds are still there. Uh, obviously, the, the Pharisees and the leaders of the synagogue are all there too. Only well, this time, it is not Jesus somehow uh, cautiously uh, uh, being asked questions about his uh, authority, but they're asking questions about his very identity. No doubt there were many teachers in the time of Christ, uh, most uh, probably quoted other teachers, many probably gave us their credentials, another leader from the synagogue or uh, maybe another faction of the church, depending on whether they were Pharisees or Sadducees or some other group or faction of zealots. Like Lutherans, there were probably plenty of expressions of the Jewish faith, just as there are plenty of expressions of the Lutheranism. However, this parable tells a story that suggests not that Jesus somehow possessed uh, the wrong flavor of authority, but that he was, he was claiming to be of the highest authority because as the Son of God, his authority was directly coming from the Father. So keep that in mind. That might be uh, important for us to talk about later. Now I wonder this morning if you have had that experience of having something that was yours, that was taken away. Like the children's sermon, I think sometimes uh, we run the risk of having things taken away if we don't take care of them. I had a friend, uh, he's a great friend from college. Uh, we still are in communication now and then. Uh, my friend is a researcher. He has spent his life doing experiments and collecting data for a very large company. Some years ago, my friend uh, came to me and he expressed how deeply he had been hurt when after more than two years of research, he had a new boss that came in and claimed the credit for all the research that he had dedicated his life to for the past two years. Maybe you've had a similar experience. The parable of the, of the landowner expresses the landowner's frustration over some tenants who refused to return to him a portion of the harvest owed to him. But it also takes a very critical turn when not only is the harvest stolen from him, but those whom he sent to retrieve his portion of the harvest are mistreated and killed and stoned. And finally, his very own son is put to death. Now the parable tells us that before killing the heir, they first threw him out of the vineyard. The murder of, their heir, of the heir is certainly bad enough, but the landowner will surely deal harshly with these murdering thieves. But it must not be overlooked that in throwing the son out of the vineyard, they were suggesting that the vineyard was and always had been theirs, kicking him out as if it wasn't any part of his inheritance. It's impossible not to interpret the message of the parable. The chief priests and Pharisees see it clear that the vineyard is the life uh, that clings to God uh, that is given to the people. The tenants are those whom God calls to tend and care for his people. No doubt sometimes we think we own and somehow possess this vineyard this ministry, even here at Kenwood. If we could just keep God out of this, how much easier would this be? God is so intrusive at times, so noisy, a nosy, right? We could conduct the kind of ministry that places our needs at the center, maybe a little power play, maybe a lot of glory, maybe wealth, maybe position. Have you ever heard or seen ministries like that? The evening news is filled with reminders of churches and ministries that do exactly that. Somehow they lost their center. I need to make a shift here, so bear with me, okay? Because I want to talk about something else and then bring this idea back in. Now there, time and again, in Matthew and also the other gospel accounts, we hear these words. I'm going to uh, give the whole uh, section and then I'm going to take out a little piece of that. And when the chief priests 
and the Pharisees handed Jesus, uh, heard Jesus' parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. And they sought to seize him. They became, however, afraid of the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Now, the words that I want to lift out of that little text is this word here, for fear of the crowds. Now, we're living in a time where fear of the crowd is a common experience. In many of these texts, the gospel stories, the crowd seem to somehow function as a protective element for Jesus and at times even for the disciples. The crowds are there and people are afraid of what the crowds will do. We live in a time where authority and demonstrations find themselves at odds with each other and sometimes the actions of the crowd protect the innocent and other times they may protect the guilty. We also will witness just a few chapters uh, uh, later in Matthew how the authorities use the crowds to have Jesus crucified. So the crowds have more than one function in Scripture. There is no balance here. Demonstrators can be either one good or evil. But the parable puts a qualifier in the text. And that is that God is judge. Nothing more needs be said. There is both terror and relief in that, uh, uh, that understanding in this parable. God is a God of mercy, yes. God is also one who takes from those whose intent to take the kingdom uh, for their own purposes and instead of caring for God's kingdom and his people and he will deal with them harshly. There is punishment in these words too, isn't there? Jesus tells that, us that as a cornerstone, his presence is confrontational. He refuses to share the position of cornerstone with any other thing, person, or power that would take his place. We are living in a time where a lot is up in the air. Who are we? Whose are we? What is true? What is truth? Who should we follow? The crowds are unsettling to us. Definitely crowds in the streets of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, downtown Minneapolis or Seattle. These are difficult times. They're unsettling experience for us. It causes us to question, but also then to re-examine our lives. The question whether we too seek to kill the one who speaks truth to us, to keep ourselves as the center and cornerstone of our own lives. Am I by my own complacency, murder or messenger? At some point with Peter, we will probably have to ask ourselves, Lord, to whom shall we go? As these questions became more difficult, the disciples started realizing he's inviting us to take up a cross and follow him. I'm not sure that I want to do that. And it says after Jesus became very talking plainly about that, many of the followers ceased to follow him. But then Peter says, but Lord, only you have the words of life. I think that we live in a time where this is confusing and maybe it's unsettling when things are happening around us that we are not accustomed to, but at the same time it gives us a chance to embrace a little bit of the chaos and embrace a little bit of the re-evaluating who we follow, who is our cornerstone. I invite you then this week to ponder that as other questions come up. And then I want to encourage you, be strong, my friends. Be unafraid. Our rock, as we claim here at Kenwood Lutheran, right? Built on a rock, our cornerstone is Christ alone. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
and all the other places that we find uh, a, a, a very big harvest and uh, help us to be good laborers here uh, today. Um, and then just a, an offer, a prayer of thanksgiving for the gifts that have been brought forward and continue to be with us. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with good food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now receive this blessing. Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. And then remember, go in peace and remember the poor. Thanks be to God.